Hello, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Katie Compoletti. I'm a, a movement disorders uh, neurologist at the Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. And uh, I'm going to spend the next half an hour or so talking about neurogenic orthostatic hypertension. Blood pressure control is a very uh, complicated process for the body, and it depends on an elaborate network of receptors, nerves, and hormones, and to a large degree on the nervous system. And uh, the part of the nervous system that uh, uh, assigns to control the blood pressure in the most part is the, what we call the autonomic nervous system, and that's the part of the nervous system that, that's outside and our voluntary control. The autonomic nervous system can be divided in two parts. Uh, one part is the sympathetic nervous system, and the other part is the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system controls what we call the fight and flight response. That's, and that's a very primitive response that all animals have, including humans. So when we face danger or when, it's, when we're scared, our heart rate goes up, the, start, the heart starts pounding, the blood pressure goes up, we start sweating, hair goes up, and that's what we call the fight and flight response. And that's mainly responsible for increasing blood pressure. The parasympathetic nervous system on the other side, on the other hand, is responsible for controlling mostly in the guts and the, uh, and the, among other things, and the bladder and all this. And is the part of the nervous system, of the autonomic nervous system that controls the, what we call the rest and digest functions that puts us more into a kind of a, a resting mode, if you will. And that tends to lower the blood pressure. And here you see the how uh, widespread the effects of uh, the autonomic nervous system are in the body. And in uh, green, you can see it's uh, the sympathetic nervous system. And uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, in green is the parasympathetic nervous system. And in uh, orange is the sympathetic nervous system. And you can see here that the control every single organ in the body, starting from the eye, moving down to the glands that secrete uh, 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 saliva, makes us drool, make us drool, the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the liver, the, uh, the gut, the intestines, all the way down to the bladder. So let's move on to a definition now. So what is orthostatic hypotension? So basically what it means is the drop in the blood pressure when the person assumes the upright position. And more specifically, it's defined as a sustained decrease in the systolic blood pressure, that's the upper parts of the blood pressure, of 20 millimeters of mercury or more, or a decrease in the diastolic blood pressure of 10 millimeters of mercury. And that should happen within three minutes of standing when compared to the blood pressure from sitting or laying down. And, those, that's a, and these are the rules we follow when we tell people to monitor whether they drop their blood pressure at home. So when we talk about orthostatic hypotension, we don't always talk about neuro, neurogenic orthostatic hypotension that's mediated by diseases that affect the nervous system. Then you can have orthostatic hypotension if you're dehydrated, if you haven't drunk enough water, or if you're taking um, excessive amounts of uh, antihypertensives to lower your blood pressure, or sometimes the bladder medications can do that, or from other reasons, a lot of times associated with aging, like all things in life. So the neurogenic orthostatic hypotension affects diseases like uh, multiple system atrophy or Parkinson's disease. And a difference here is that in multiple system atrophy, the mechanisms that fail are more 
uh, in the central parts of the nervous system, as is the case with uh, spinal cord injuries. Uh, while in Parkinson's disease, dementia with Lewy body, pure autonomic failure, and neuropathies, peripheral neuropathies, the peripheral nervous system is more uh, uh, at fault so rather than the uh, central nervous system. And uh, what happens when somebody drops their blood pressure when they stand up? First of all, they have non-specific symptoms like uh, generalized weakness, lethargy, fatigue, falls, nausea, or leg buckling. They can have other symptoms resulting from decreased blood flow to the brain, like dizziness, lightheadedness, uh, presyncope and syncope, that means loss of consciousness, cognitive problems, and headache. And they ha can have problem blurred vision from decreased blood flow to the eyes. They can have the very characteristic neck and shoulder pain, what we call the coat hanger headache, which can be very specific for orthostatic hypotension. And uh, that results for decreased uh, bad blood supply to the muscles of the shoulders and the neck. And they can have chest pains, angina, resulting from decreased blood supply to the heart. And they can have uh, a, a shortness of breath when about upon standing, resulting from decreased blood supply to the lungs. So usually what happens is that uh, you have a lot of related symptoms and the basic ones are dizziness and syncope and loss of consciousness. Uh, and that, that can result in weakness, deconditioning, and more orthostatic hypotension. Falling, that can result in injuries, fractures, and pain, or increased confusion because of lack of blood supply to the brain, that can is, is result in behavioral issues, which can usually people try to address with psychotropic medications, resulting in more orthostatic hypotension. And, uh, all this create that vicious cycle that result in further decrease in function, quality in life, and increase in mortality. So when we see somebody we suspect has orthostatic hypotension or neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, what do we ask them? We ask them, have you fainted or blacked out recently? Do you feel dizzy or lightheaded when you stand up? Do you have problems with vision, like blurred vision when you stand up? Do you have difficulty breathing when you stand up? Do you have leg buckling or leg weakness when you stand up? Do you ever experience neck pain or aching when you stand up? Do the above symptoms improve or disappear when you sit down or lay down? Are the above symptoms worse in the morning, when, right after you get out of bed, on after meals? And I'm, I'm gonna come back to that later. Have you experienced the fall recently? Are there any other symptoms you commonly experience when you stand or within three to five minutes of standing and get better when you lay down? And all this Question. Some of this can happen from other reasons. For example, people with uh, multiple system atrophy or people with Parkinson's disease fall a lot. That could be from the disease, that could be from dropping blood pressure. Sometimes it's very hard to decipher what is what. So that's why sometimes it can be in the presence of other problems. Some of these questions can have multiple answers. So when, what happens when we stand up, when we assume the upright position? So when a person is supine, the blood pressure, the blood volume is distributed throughout the body. Upon standing, uh, more than half a liter of the blood is moves to the lower body. And then the autonomic nervous system senses that so through some reflexes and gets activated. Specifically, the sympathetic nervous system gets activated 
and in a healthy subject results in a, the normal compensatory response that uh, it, it, uh, releases norepinephrine and you're going to hear a lot more about norepinephrine in the rest of the talk and uh, that norepinephrine results in increase in blood pressure and heart rate and that means there is enough pressure for the blood to travel all the way up to the brain and cerebral perfusion is maintained. So you don't feel dizzy, you don't pass out, you don't feel hazy or as having brain fog. So in patients with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, this mechanism is insufficient. It doesn't work very well because the autonomic nervous system doesn't work well. And there is, the signal is not sent or the response is not adequate. So the heart rate and the blood pressure do not decrease to the point where you sustain enough pressure to push all that pulled blood from the lower body all the way up to the brain. And thus the individual experiences those symptoms, uh, including dizziness and lightheadedness or ooziness. And here you see in the bottom, you see the fluctuation of the blood pressure of an individual when they lay down. You see when they lay down, the blood pressure is in the 20, 120s over 80s. And looking at the upper panel, that creates enough pressure and velocity in the brain as measured by ultrasound in, the, in a big artery in the brain, the middle cerebral artery or MCA, it creates enough pressure so the blood can circulate and supply enough uh, circulation for the brain to function. When the person gets up, you have all that uh, you know, dizziness depicted in that uh, little cartoon here. The blood pressure falls, in this case falls from 120 to 66. And the, you see the, the pressure that gets in the brain in that big artery drops as well. And that's not enough for a, enough, it's like plumbing. You don't have enough pressure, you don't have enough blood supplying the vital areas of the brain. Sitting is a situation that's uh, in between standing and uh, laying down. And uh, that's de depicted here, both in the blood pressure in the lower panel and in the velocity of the blood when it uh, supplies the brain in the upper panel. So here you see in the, in the green, you see throughout the day how the blood pressure fluctuates. So you see there are minor fluctuations. The green line goes up, goes down for different reasons. And then when the person goes to, to bed during night time, you see that the green line drops. So the, the normal mechanism is that the blood pressure should drop at night, we're in bed, when we are in bed, resting and sleeping and having nice dreams, hopefully. And it gets up again, it raises when the person gets out of bed. The purple line shows you what happens in a person with a neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. You see the blood pressure goes up, spikes up, goes down, and all this keeps happening throughout the day. And when you go to bed, when that person goes to bed at night, you see that instead of the blood pressure dropping, which is the normal thing to happen at night, the blood pressure spikes right up and it's really high. But not only that, but you see what happens around seven, eight o'clock in the morning when they get out of bed, it just dives down deep. And that can be enough to have somebody pass out when they getting out of bed in the morning. So why is this happening? Why is this person ha having this reaction in the blood pressure? Well, that's really like a roller coaster with very fast ups and downs that uh, can make that life difficult because you, know, you cannot uh, tolerate standing up for long periods of time or doing regular activities and can uh, affect vital organs. For example, 
you drop your blood pressure, you are at risk for having a heart attack. If you have some problems already tight, uh, blood vessels in your heart, or for having a, a stroke, if your blood ves vessels in the brain are tight and you decrease the pressure of the blood that goes through it, and these responses are sustained. So here you see some of the reasons why we have the drops during the day. On the left, you see what happens during the day. There are big dips, as you see in the red line, during meals. The blue line is the diastolic blood pressure and the red line is the uh, systolic blood pressure. And you see every time the person eats, blood pressure goes down. And at night, when they get up to pee, the blood pressure also goes down. And in the morning, when they get out of bed to start their day, the blood pressure also dives down below. So what happens with meals, a lot of the blood pulls into the abdominal gastrointestinal area to help digest the food. And that's the reason we have those dips. So what do we do? How do we diagnose neurogenic orthostatic hypertension? First of all, we ask the right questions or we try to listen to our patients, you know, when somebody says, this, I'm dizzy, we have to make sure, we have to ask the right questions to figure out whether dizziness, what dizziness is. And uh, to be honest with you, dizziness is the word that doctors hate, absolutely hate, because it can mean so many different things. So dizziness can mean that somebody is off balance. It can mean that somebody has vertigo, which is a spinning sensation when you turn your head. Or it can mean that you, can, you drop your blood pressure, as is the case in orthostatic hypertension. So what do we do after we get the right clues as to what we're dealing with? We do the blood pressures. We have the blood, a person see it or lay down for five to 10 minutes, and then we take the blood pressure. Then we have them stand, wait one to three minutes and take the blood pressure again. And that's one, one snapshot in time. That's not enough. We send them home, we have them do the same thing, like seven to 10 days in a row at different times in the day where they document the time in the day and they document the blood pressure sitting or standing or laying down or standing. And then we can correlate that with the times they take medication, with the times they, uh, they have meals to see what the effect of all these things is on blood pressure. Then we review their medications, make sure when they take their antihypertensives, the blood pressure medicine. There are some people who wake up in the morning, take, their carbidopa levodopa for their MSA or for their Parkinson's disease, then take their blood pressure medication together with that and then have breakfast, which is kind of pancakes for breakfast and bacon, for example. And then they try to get up from the table and they pass out because they just had a triple whammy. They have quadruple, if you will. They have the orthostatic hypotension from the disease they have, they taken the carbidopa levodopa, which lowers the blood pressure. All antipypensonian medication lowers the blood pressure. They take the blood pressure medication that the doctor has given them because previously in life they had high blood pressure. And they eat all at the same time. And then it all crashes. And then after we review the medication, we evaluate causes of uh, uh, neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, and we review cardiac history, perform cardiograms if appropriate. And finally, sometimes, not always, we send people for special testing, and that includes autonomic testing like plasma catecholamine, so we're going to talk about this later, pseudomotor function testing with the, we would do the sweat testing, and 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And there is a special uh, uh, test for the heart to see how 
the autonomic dysfunction affects the heart. So next slide. Uh, how do we treat? Once we diagnose neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, we have to decide how to treat it. And uh, first, like with all uh, issues, we try to go the conservative route with non-pharmacological, like lifestyle adjustments. And if that doesn't work, we resolve to using medications. And first we start, as I said, with lifestyle, physical activity, and meal, meals adjustments. We tell the individual to avoid hot, humid weather, avoid hot showers and saunas, avoid prolonged bed rest during the day, avoid physical immobility, uh, because after you've been laying down a lot and you stand up, boom, the blood pressure falls. Avoid high carbohydrate meals, especially meals with high glycemic index carbohydrates. Remember that person I told you before, had the pancakes and bacon for breakfast? together with all these medications, and then boom, he had, uh, he passed out. And avoid daytime alcohol. Alcohol and caffeine uh, may temporarily increase the blood pressure, but then they send you to the bathroom, they make you urinate. So they deplete your volume, your intravascular volume. Then we encourage exercise, mostly in a recumbent or seated position, like rowing or stationary bike. We encourage exercise in a swimming pool and we encourage frequent smaller meals, including low high, high, uh, glycemic index high carbohydrates. And here you see a chart of what high glycemic index carbohydrates are. And that's, they are on the right and they are all the foods that a lot of people tell you to avoid. And you see what are the more appropriate types of foods on the left. A very important thing in patients with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension is volume expansion. We tell people to avoid alcohol or caffeine. As I said before, alcohol and caffeine are diuretics. They enhance uh, urination, so they deplete your volume and avoid sugary beverages. We encourage increased fluid intake, up to two and a half liters a day, eight glasses a day, eight big glasses a day, and uh, salt liberalization, so contrary to what almost other people do. And the, but there is a caveat to that. If you have a heart history or if you have a lot of supine hypertension as well, I would uh, talk to your cardiologist regarding salt. And then we encourage acute water boluses. When you feel fainty, like you're going to pass out, just drink half a liter of water fast. And that should increase your blood pressure within five to 10 minutes. Or, you know, sometimes all you have to deal with that is eat uh, a bag of potato chips, salty potato chips. There are some physical maneuvers that help uh, increase the blood pressure and, and some that make it go down. You should, every person should avoid straining with closed glottis. That's the back of the throat. And that's when, when you uh, strain to have a bowel movement or when people who try to have a baby when are in labor, you all recognize that kind of maneuver. That's called the Valsama maneuver and can make people, uh, people's blood pressure bottom down. We encourage changing positions gradually. We tell people, especially in the morning, sit at the side of the bed before you stand up. Don't jump out of bed. Briefly sit before standing, leg crossing, standing on tiptoe, stooping, squatting, and buttock cleansing also help sustain that blood pressure, push it up as needed. Then uh, something that most doctors advise, first, as first time they see you for orthostatic hypotension is uh, compression stockings. But in order for the compression stockings to work, they have to be high waist compression stockings 
15 to 20 millimeters of mercury. These are very hard to put on, especially for older people or people with, uh, and very hard to take off, especially if you are running to the bathroom with urgency. So when you new, use knee-high compression stockings, then you don't treat anything. You might as well not do it at all. And also another thing people can use, and it's quite easy, is an abdominal binder. They're easy to buy. You can buy them on Amazon. And you don't have to wait, wear them the whole day. You can wear them after meals, for example, when you, or uh, times of the day, you know, your blood pressure is lower. And what this does, it helps push the blood up and uh, sustain blood pressure in the upper parts of the body. And uh, these are similar to the ones some people use for back pain. And then the big thing that a lot of people overlook and I'm telling people time and time again, elevate the head of the bed. So these days with the modern beds, with the modern mattresses, it's easy to do it. If you have a wet bed, you just elevate it 30 degrees. And that does wonders. First of all, it decreases the heart, high blood pressure that goes uh, straight to the head at night when you're laying flat. Second, it decreases the overnight fluid loss and the drop in the blood pressure that happens when you stand up to go to the bathroom. I could emphasize more how important that is for nighttime uh, hypertension and uh, the drop that people get when you, they go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and when they get out of bed in the morning. And this is a little chart that has it all, you know, that it has the what to avoid, like the heat exposure, the, we well, actually have those in the clinic and they, you know, in the ch little chart shows you all the things to avoid, all the things to do, like salt and water, elevate the head of the bed, abdominal binders or hose, and it maneuvers that increase the blood pressure, drinking uh, 16 ounces or two big glasses of water when you feel like you're kind of getting close to passing out, uh, and uh, exercising mostly in the recovery position or swimming. And all these are things that are uh, kind of very important and uh, it's a big part of how you can address this problem without having to resolve to medications. But sometimes we can still attempt to live better through pharmacology. And that's when we come to medications. And right now there are two medications that are approved for uh, orthostatic, FDA approved for orthostatic uh, 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 hypotension. And these include Midodrine, other name is Proamatin, or Droxidopa, the other name is Nurthera. And uh, I mean, not being FDA approved doesn't mean that we cannot use other medications. And uh, the bottom list has the medications that we use that are not approved. And these include Atomoxetine, which is uh, Stratera, is a medication approved for ADHD, Fludrocortisone or Florinath, and the pyridostamine or mestinone is a medication we use for myasthenia gravis. First, Florinet or fludrocortisone, very old fashioned medication, very easy to use once a day in the morning. Uh, increases, what it does is a volume expander and increases water and sod sodium reabsorption by the kidneys. So it increases your volume, your intervascular volume. And it thus increases the blood pressure in all position. In doses higher than uh, two pills a day, you don't get any further improvement. Once you are up to two pills and you still need something else, you do need something else. Don't bother raising it more. Side effects, it makes your ankle swell. And that's not as much of a problem. You just put your feet up and learn to live with that. Don't use a diuretic because, you know, you kind of defeat the purpose. You just get in rid of a lot of the water you try to preserve to increase your intravascular volume. People get fixated with the ankle edema. In a sense, if it doesn't come from the heart or the kidneys, 
you just just deal with it by elevating your feet and that's or by activating your feet like when you do bicycle or something and a lot of parkinson's patients or msa patients can have ankle edema without necessarily having heart or uh, kidney problems and low potassium is another thing that the, this can do pleurocomorphism can result in and if you use it for a long time there is a potential for a permanent damage to the heart or uh, the kidneys so this is a medication that should not be used for long periods of time and then we come to the main medications that uh, we use for orthostatic hypotension and these all enhance the sympathetic nervous system and they all work in different ways by enhancing norepinephrine. Remember norepinephrine? We talked about it in the beginning. It's uh, the main chemical involved in the fight and flight response. And um, the first one is the promatin or midodrine. And uh, the second one is droxidopa or northera. And the third one is uh, stratera or atomoxetine, amproloxetine is kind of a dream that didn't materialize and I'm going to talk a little bit about that and a lot of people in the community, in the MSA community already know about it. So the, the chart on the left, the cartoon on the left, is kind of complicated, but all I, I'm trying to show you here, I'm not trying to make you go to medical school, is to see how spread in the system where all this works kind of uh, in in what part of the system so as you see on the right all we want to do is we increase norepinephrine the norepinephrine stimulates the nerve endings at blood vessels makes makes the blood vessels tighten and increases the blood pressure so there as you see here on the left there are different ways of enhancing norepinephrine and droxidopa, atomoxetine, and mitodrine all do it in different ways. And they work in close proximity to the blood vessels. They eventually tighten the blood vessels, thus increasing the pressure. And pyridostigmine asks, uh, acts on a different part of the system. That's the parasympathetic system. Remember the rest and digest part of the system but it asks by acts by inhibiting that. So the oldest medication that was accepted, uh, approved for treatment of orthostatic hypotension was promatin or midodrin. It was FDA approved in 1996, and it's a very fairly short acting medication. That's, that's why people have to take it every three hours or so. And it has, but it works fast. It has a peak effect after an hour. The main side effects, it can make your blood pressure spike up a lot. And so people who stay in bed the whole day are not good candidates for this medication or people who, uh, they shouldn't, people should not take it so like uh, more, more closer to bedtime, more the closer than three, four hours before bedtime. And uh, in, for that reason, when you try to, when you land in the hospital for the treatment of this disease, a lot of times people are going to be found to have high blood pressure. And then they stop your uh, midodrine and they send you home. And then in real life, you're standing more or sitting more than laying down as you do in the hospital. And you keep going back and forth with the same problem. So hospitals are not the right places to assess these situations because people spend a lot of time laying down. So this medicine can also cause goosebumps, scalp eating, or urinary retention. But the main problem is the uh, effect that it elevates blood pressure sometimes too much. Northera, who works in a different way, it becomes norepinephrine itself. Uh, Midodrine, works at the nerve at the terminals on the blood vessels pretends that it's norepinephrine and uh, northera is a precursor of norepinephrine so it gets 
transform to norepinephrine and acts as norepinephrine. It was approved in the United States in 2014, in Japan in 1989. It's also short-acting, but uh, it, it takes longer to get to the peak effect. Uh, it has best response in patients with low norepinephrine. That's the case with midodrine, and that would be people more with Parkinson rather than MSA. And the side effects, again, include supine hypertension, headache, and nausea. One point here, I mean, and that's anecdotal, it's my personal experience, I found uh, Northera to create less sustained increase in the blood pressure, less spikes than uh, midodrine. And finally, is uh, the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and these are atomoxetin and amproloxetin. Stratera, as I said before, is an uh, ADHD medication that uh, works by uh, decreasing the reuptake of norepinephrine at the terminals. That makes it more available to work at the, those blood vessels, at the nerve endings of the blood vessels. And uh, this works when there is norepinephrine there already. And that's thus, it's more useful in patients theoretically with MSA rather than Parkinson's disease. Amproloxetin, which was in clinical trials uh, uh, before, uh, didn't quite work uh, in the clinical trials. So it was, uh, it resulted in uh, negative clin uh, outcomes and the company decided to pull the plug and stop the further development of the medication. I have a, it seems that some of the improvement we saw was seen mainly by the MSA patients. The, whether that will result in further development of the medication or not uh, is unclear at this point, but uh, it failed phase three trials but it's more likely that it worked better for the MSA patients than with the, for the Parkinson's patients. And uh, if you took the MSA patients into account alone, it may have been a good medication to pursue. Going back to show you the midodrine versus doxydopa, you see the midodrine, you see that uh, the, effect, the effect is right away, while in doxydopa, it takes uh, three, to three and a half hours to reach that maximum effect. So as I said before, the, uh, there's a one useful blood test you could do is check peripheral plasma or epinephrine levels. And when they're low, that means that the problem is in the periphery. And that uh, would be the medications like uh, atomoxetin or amproloxetin wouldn't work because you need something to work on. In multiple system atrophy, as also in spinal cord injury, the, you need to have high norepinephrine for the medication to work. And that's also shown in the bottom of this uh, table where you have the response of droxidopa is more pronounced in patients with peripheral autonomic lesions, as is the case in Parkinson's disease. And the response to atomoxetine is more pronounced in patients with uh, central uh, lesions, as is the case in multiple system atrophy. And uh, that's why amproloxetine was uh, such a big hope for this community, but uh, unfortunately it didn't pan out. Hopefully this is not the end of it and there's gonna be further analysis may result in uh, bringing the medication to the market. Finally, the final medication is called mastinone uh, or pyridostigmine, and that enhances cholinergic transmission. That it works on the other end, other parts of the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system. It has a modif modest effect when used alone, but works better when used with midodrine or atomoxetine. So I we use it usually as add-ons when people have not responded to the other medications. So this is a kind of a busy chart, but all I'm trying to tell you is 
the sequence of events in approaching a patient with orthostatic uh, hypertension. First of all, we document a, a symptomatic fall in blood pressure when the patient assumes the upright position. Then we try to correct any aggravating factors. That means other medications in the most part. And a lot of the medications we need to pay attention to are uh, either uh, the uh, antihypertensives, medications people take for high blood pressure, blood, some of the bladder medications, some of the antipsychotics people can take for you know behavioral issues or for sleep, and the antiparkinsonian medications, carbidopa, lipidopa, and all the antiparkinsonian medications can drop the blood pressure. And then if we don't have improvement by adjusting all these other variables, we tell people to do the lifestyle and non-pharmacological adjustment, adjustments, like uh, the mon most important is water and elevating the head of the bed. And if that doesn't work, we go to pharmacological treatment. If the patient is volume depleted, we use fludrocortisone. If the patient is not volume depleted, we check the plasma norepinephrine. If the plasma norepinephrine is low, we use droxidopa or midodrine. If the plasma norepinephrine is high, we use norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, which is atomoxetin right now, because amproloxetin unfortunately never made it to the market. And uh, this is kind of a, the a, chart we follow in our decision making to approach patients with uh, orthostatic, neurogenic orthostatic hypertension. And that brings me to the end of this talk, and I would be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you so much.